Dr. Lin has received her medical degree from the Harvard MIT program at Harvard Medical School and did her internal medicine internship at Stanford Hospital and Clinics and her dermatology residency at the Harvard Combined Program. She completed her T32 research training in Dr. David Fisher's lab and went on to complete her a laser fellowship as well at Mass General Hospital at Wellman Institute under Drs. Rox Anderson and Matt Abram. She then also completed a postdoc in a melanoma stem, stem cell lab under Dr. Marcus Frank. During her 15 years at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Dr. Lynn became the director of the Melanoma Risk and Prevention Clinic, which was formerly the Pigmented Lesion Clinic, and was the lead dermatologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute's Melanoma Program. During her directorship, Dr. Lynn helped bring an AI-assisted total body photography and reflectance confocal microscopy to assist in the care of high-risk melanoma patients. She also co-founded the Skin of Color a Clinic with a special interest in lasers and cosmetic treatments in skin of color. In addition to all of this, Dr. Lynn has authored over 30 papers in melanocyte biology, melanoma, and laser and light-based therapies. She speaks both nationally and internationally on pigmented lesions and devices, and she's a member of the Society of Melanoma Research, the Pigmented Lesion Subcommittee at the AED, and the American Society of Lasers and Surgery and Medicine. It looks like Dr. Lynn does it all. We're very, very excited to have her joining us at UCSD and very excited for her talk. Thank you for that uh, really nice introduction. I'm really happy to be here. Um, and I wanted to start off with a acknowledgement um, or I guess a Gen Z, more Gen Z word would say a shout out to Dr. Mar Marty Mim. Um, who passed away last summer. If, for anyone who knew him, he was a, a giant in our field. Um, the term superficial spreading melanoma, acrolentigious melanoma, nausea melanoma came from him, Wallace Clark, amongst other, others. Um, and as we all know, uh, a dermatologist, dermatopathologist is a rare breed, <laughs> Brian Hines. Um, so um, he really was dedicated um, even right before he passed, he was talking on the phone with a colleague, talking about what he still needed to do. So some of the messages that I thought were useful to pass on was be kind and positive. He always had a great word to say to anybody who he walked by. Work hard to help patients, particularly vulnerable populations, such as the pediatric population. Um, he created our first vascular anomalies clinic that was on Saturdays that brought together different specialties. Um, often these families couldn't pay for their treatment. Teach the next generation and be generous with your knowledge. Connect with your international colleagues and peers as research knowledge surface opportunities only grows by reaching out across the world. Um, Dr. Mim spoke like six languages fluently uh, and he was always making new connections and often fostered international collaborations. And finally, laugh often and follow your passion. He was um, a big supporter of the opera and classical music. Um, and he always followed those too. Okay, so there is a font change, but you can still read. Um, so we have, I am gonna be ambitious and try to cover a lot of ground to first talk about the newest therapies, which are some of them are not so new anymore, like the last decade. Um, and then the idea of neoadjuvant versus adjuvant treatment of melanoma. And then I'm going to get a little bit into what I think dermatologists excel at, which is the concept of immunogenicity of tumors and how do we get the immune system to react. Um, and then my um, personal favorite issue of intransient metastases. So we've long known that your body can mount a response naturally to monocytic tumors, both in melanoma and as halo nevi. And for a long time, when we were trying to attack cancer, we were focused both on the mutational component, so oncogenes that drive um, growth, as well as loss of tumor suppressors, which halt normal um, replication. But what became sort of into focus was avoiding immune destruction. So we were really good at getting T cells to be juiced up and ramped up, but there was a certain subset of patients that never responded um, and it turns out that if you lift the natural breaks of the immune system, so breaks that were already in place, um, then we saw a, a big difference in survival. So just to give you again this idea of how much has changed, um, from the beginning, we only had decarbazine, and then we only had IL-2, and this is about when 
Dr. Steven Rosenberg was working on TILS, which just got approved uh, a few weeks ago. And then in 2011, we had an explosion of medications, um, specifically for melanoma, but many that crossed over into other tumors. It's sort of <clears throat> helpful to remember that if it's an AB at the end as an antibody, and so it's usually blocking um, an Im uh, immune mediated pathway, whereas if it's IB, it's uh, an inhibitor and is inhibiting uh, a kinase. So that's sort of helpful because it gets a little confusing after a while. And this is the last one, Lithaluso, I might not be pronouncing it correctly, is TILS, essentially. So we're going to couch our understanding through a case. So this is a 58-year-old Caucasian male. He had a blue-black plaque on his scalp for at least a year. And he did have a significant history in that he had already had metastatic squamous cell of his right tonsil. He had that removed. He had chemo radiation. And actually, I didn't include it, but he did have a few lymph nodes removed as well. So the biopsy showed an intermediate thickness melanoma with some mitoses, no ulceration. He qualified for sentinel lymph node biopsy, and that was negative. Uh, sorry, was negative in the cervical node, um, but he had had a posterior auricular node that was positive, and so he got this removed as well as the rest of his parotid gland, and he was staged as a three A. A three A actually has a pretty decent prognosis, about nine eighty eight to ninety percent over ten years. But about eight months later, he developed these tiny bumps all around the irradiated side of his neck. Um, and these were consistent with epider epidermotropic metastases. And at this point, we genotyped the patient's tumor. Oh, I'm gonna come back to it again later. So again, just to show you, um, uh, and he's a stage four now um, with skin metastases. So that's still before the advent immunotherapy is a 30% um, five-year survival. So in 2011, uh, NCCN guidelines was clinical trial because there really was nothing really that well, working that well. In 2024, we have a very complicated array of options. Um, and so we'll go into some of those. So he was typed as BRAFI 600K. Um, and so he was at the right time to be eligible um, for BRAF inhibitors. So BRAF inhibitors um, were unusual in that they were highly selective. So the predecessors were tyrosine kinase inhibitors and they hit multiple kinases. But this was specific to BRAF or E mutation. It was orally available, which was also new. Um, and it was very exciting. So the MAP kinase pathway is um, in every cell type because it is a regulator of growth. And typically, as you see on the right-hand side, you need a ligand to stimulate the cell to grow, and it cascades through a MAP kinase pathway. In the setting of an oncogenic BRAF, this signal no longer, this kinase no longer needs the outside signal, and it keeps signaling downstream, phosphorylating these kinases to um, stimulate growth. So it turns out that BRAF V cisgender E is seen in 80% of nevi. So it's an early mutation, but it does not mean that this is a cancer. It's also seen in 50% of metastatic melanoma. And when we start, first started giving the drug, we were half expecting to see that some of the moles would go away. Um, they did not. And so that gives you a sense of um, uptake of the drug will depend a little bit on the kinetics of the tumor. We further have confirmed that a mole can turn into a melanoma based on this um, paper from UCSF, which looked at lesions that had melanoma in situ right next to melanoma, and they cored out those areas and sequenced them. And they show that there truly is a progression um, starting from a benign lesion to intermediate lesion in terms of what mutations they gain as they progress. Um, and so an intermediate mutation would be TERP mutation, which is now commonly used in a lot of these um, gene array studies um, or these predictor studies like tape stripping. Um, and then all the way to invasive melanoma where you're really losing your tumor suppressors like CDK and 2A and P53. So BRAF or E is the most, the, the change to a valine to glutamic acid is the most common kind we've seen, um, but you can have other amino acid substitutions as well is typically seen in our younger patient. I think of it as most of our superficial spreading melanomas are going to have this mutation. They're usually highly mitotic. They're usually on the trunk. 
V600K is actually a little bit more unusual as usually seen in older patients associated with lung and brain metastases. So that's um, actually the mutation he had. So we he took vemurafenib and just like the paper suggested, New England Journal paper, there was a rapid response. So this is one of the advantages of these um, inhibitors. They work very quickly um, and all of them uh, respond. So here again, in that original paper, they showed a wily metastatic melanoma responding in, in, in a few weeks. The trouble is though, that they all eventually developed resistance and your mean progression survival only increased from like 5.5 months to like, I think it was like eight months. So it wasn't a huge change. Oh, here, here we have the curve here. So sorry, mean progression free survival was 6.9 months. So it was a modest improvement, but the biggest problem was that they all acquired resistance. And the side effect, just like I, I, I you know, we, you guys just brought this up about the cratoacanthomas, the oncologists were super worried about the secondary tumor uh, cutaneous cell carcinoma. And we, uh, um, dermatologists were involved with sort of telling them like, okay, this is not what's gonna <laughs> kill the patient. But um, so here's an example of one of our patients with a classic cratoacanthoma in terms of its cup-like structure and central hyperkeratosis. So why are you growing new tumors if you are throwing an inhibitor on board? And it turns out there's a BRAF inhibitor paradox. So um, uh, BRAF does not work alone. It's part of the family of RAF proteins, which includes ARAF and CRAF. And they both homodimerize and heterodimerize. So in the setting of a mutant RAS, which is already overactivated, the inhibited BRAF almost acts like a scaffold and actually provides increased downstream signaling um, through MAC, um, MAC kinase uh, and ERK and eventually increased growth again. So in certain cell types where the RAS is already mutated, um, you actually get an overexpression. So some really clever people went back and looked at, took those KAs and sequenced them. And sure enough, um, most of them contain RAS mutations. And so this gives us a little insight into when we deal with KAs ourselves um, to think about sort of the etiology. So they're usually some damage sites. Um, they can be sort of triggered from trauma alone. Um, I would only speculate in the setting of the PD-1 inhibition that everyone's been talking about and why they have an increased risk. And we certainly saw some people with really exuberant responses. This was a young man with stage four melanoma. He happened to be a smoker. And we saw this with a lot of our smokers. Their side effect profile was a lot worse. And so in these patients, um, dose reduction was usually done. And we also did, just like you described, really sort of more palliative treatments like topical, topical treatments and photodynamic therapy to treat them. Okay. So our patient, same, just like we expected, developed resistance and his tumor marched on. So nowadays you never give VREF inhibitor alone. You always give the two together, VREF inhibitor, MEK inhibitor at the same time. And I, I, I think of this like the, um, the boy in Holland with a dike, right? So he, he closes one hole and the water rushes out this other way and he pokes another hole. And that's what we're doing with melanoma. We keep trying to plug the different um, pathways. So the benefit of doing the combination is uh, delayed in resistance. In fact, now you're going to get long-term survivors. Toxicity was pretty much wiped out. When you put the two together, there's really no KA formation or very low, low level um, and uh, improved clinical outcome. So this was one of the COMBI studies looking at different dosages of combination BREF inhibitor and MEK inhibitor. So the, the green and the yellow are two different dosings versus monotherapy BREF inhibitor alone. And you can see that there um, is an improvement in progression-free survival. And the other uh, point to take home is that there is um, a, a stabilization of the curve. And so again, the combination did lead to a group of approximately 15% of long-term survivors. And so this was the um, progression free survival study in, this, in the phase three study that really showed again that, that long lasting curve. So 
we do use BRAF inhibitor on its own individually because there are a lot of other tumors that have BRAF uh, mutations and, and MEK inhibitors are tried all the time. So just to be aware of this group. Okay, but now we're gonna move on, oh, I didn't, to the um, uh, checkpoint blockade. So checkpoint blockade comes from this idea that priming your T cell to your tumor is a critical step. Um, and in the setting of like chronic inflammation or viral infection, the T cells eventually get exhausted. And when they do, they start expressing um, signals such as PD-1 and CTL-4. And so again, here is the crosstalk between your antigen presenting cell and your T cell and all the different co-stimulatory and tolerizing signals that are being presented so that you don't have autoimmunity uh, and you do have um, uh, reaction to viruses and bacteria, for instance. So um, in the setting of CTLA-4, uh, this often happens directly at T cell priming. So it's one of the co-secondary signals you need for MHC. So typically when CTLA-4 um, is binding to the B7, then you're gonna get a tolerizing signal. So in the presence of the CTLA-4 antibody, you, you lift that break. PD-1 inhibitors, I think of happening more in the periphery, so less centrally at the tissue. Um, and so it's a little bit more involved with that concept of T cell exhaustion to the level of the tissue. Um, and again, it is a, a secondary signal that is turned on when there's been longstanding inflammation. So when you lift that, um, there's a little, lift that you get renewed T cell activation. So th the theme is gonna be, where do we find that balance? On one hand, you wanna juice up your immune system to get rid of tumor. You don't wanna cause autoimmune disease. Um, the main ones that we saw with CTLA-4 inhibitor was colitis and hypophysitis. With PD-1 inhibitor, we saw a lot of pneumonitis, hypothyroidism, and vitiligo. Um, and this will this paradigm is going to become even more important as we think about adjuvant therapy. So now we have patients who might not die from their melanoma, but we want to give them a, a boost, immune boost somehow, so that they're that they're unlikely to have re recurrence. Immune-related adverse events, as pointed out, often can come sequentially. So the rashes were very common early on, the colitis uh, a, a few months into it. Uh, and just like someone mentioned in the audience, I think Genevieve, uh, you could see a new um, rash, for instance, even after they start stop their therapy. So ipilimumab classically will cause a morbilliform rash within the first month that's not very itchy. Nothing to do because it's it self resolves. Um, vitiligo was commonly seen about four eleven percent. Photosensitivity was really common. Um, some pustular acneiform rashes as well. So ipilimumab initially uh, in this one of these first studies was compared to decarbazine. So ipilimumab plus decarbazine compared to decarbazine. Um, and as you can see, it was only a, a modest improvement. Uh, I think. I don't have, on my presenter notes, I have the exact numbers, um, but it, uh, it was about, you know, for, for progression free survival only getting to like 11 months. And one of the paradigms that we learned from ipilimumab was the idea that you can have decrease in tumor, um, but not complete. A partial response was actually still really relevant or stable response. And often in this individual had METs to his chest wall, in the beginning, the tumors would actually swell and look worse. So we call this pseudotumor progression um, before it eventually uh, went away. And as you can see, the effect is, can be very delayed in comparison to the um, kinase inhibitors. And then quickly on its heels, nivolumab came about. Nivolumab is a PD-1 inhibitor. And as you can see here as well, um, their um, overall survival was greatly improved over decarbazine. Um, at the end of this study, at 15 months, it still hadn't reached its um, plateau, so they still couldn't calculate the overall survival at this point. Um, and if we come to the, the chart over here, we have a very high response rate, about almost 50% response rate. PD-1 therapy also showed in the spider plot, again, this concept that some people 
had tumors. So these are following individual patients and the size of their tumor over time. And you see that the majority of the patients are flatlined. So their tumors are not getting smaller, but they're also not getting bigger. And that's considered a success too. So many patients live with tumor inside their bone and their muscle, but they aren't growing anymore. And in the end, combination IPI and nivolumab ended up having the highest response rate. And here is nivolumab plus IPI compared to IPI for progression-free survival. I have a nice chart here at the end to show, kind of show you the comparison. So CTLA-4 inhibitor, the big problem with CTLA-4 inhibitors is it's a really high risk of grade three or four adverse events um, compared to PD-1 inhibitor at 16%. Um, and, and Steve Hody, who I worked with, who helped discover the CTLA-4 pathway, would say it's the better molecule. PD-1 inhibitor is a better molecule. Combination therapy um, gives the patient the highest chance of a response rate. It is the preferred therapy for someone with uh, brain metastases, um, but it also will carry a higher um, grade three, four adverse event. So vitiligo like pigmentation of PD-1 inhibition was seen very commonly, um, uh, and it was different from standard PD-1 inhibition because of its distribution. So it was almost always in sun-exposed sites. There was a striking um, poliosis, and there was halo nevi. And this was seen in about 25% of patients on pembrolizumab. The most important thing about it is that it's predictive of response. Right? So the patients who developed this had a higher predictive value of responding to the drug. Um, and it was, a lot of studies have characterized how this is different from standard vitiligo vulgaris. Um, some patients also will consume their lentigos and SKs as well. Okay, and I'm not gonna go into all the PD-1 inhibitor rashes, um, but suffice to say, because of that lifting of tolerance, there's a whole lot of them. Lycoinoid rashes are really common, psoriasis, bullous pemphigoid, dermatomyositis. Um, um, Tim, like pretty much everyone has been brought up at some point. Okay, so this patient who's recurred was started on the PDL1 trial. And at first he had a pseudo tumor progression. And eventually you can see that he's starting to respond, but he's got these dominant tumors that haven't gone anywhere. So these were surgically removed. Um, and he continued to do well, and he developed vitiligo. And the date on there is 2013, and he, as far as I know, is still alive. So Neil adjuvant versus adjuvant. So the excitement was, well, we can help metastatic melanoma. Can we help um, high-risk patients, stage three? And for a period of time, that was all the rage was after you get your lymph nodes removed, you get a year of adjuvant therapy and you decrease your like, likelihood of recurrence. But then a couple of um, other studies debunked our standard of care. So one was that completion dissection was not necessary for survival. Um, it did help uh, improve uh, relapse and regional control. So here's 92% versus 77%, but did not help with survival. And so completion dissection has largely fallen out of favor. In fact, the only time the surgeons will do it is because of bulky disease. So here's an example from um, some of my colleagues back at Dana-Farber of when potentially you could use neoadjuvant therapy. So this was a woman with a deep melanoma and she already had a right axillary lymph node at the time of presentation. Um, the surgeon ended up cutting out the primary but instead of removing this lymph node, they gave three rounds of pembrolizumab um, with a complete response. So neoadjuvant therapy is the concept that we should give these medications when the tumor is still present and possibly you have the chance of, a, uh, of an improved response. So one of the um, uh, most important studies in this area is the Prado study. So personalized, response-driven adjuvant therapy after a combination of IPI and NEVO. So this was IPI and NEVO given to patients with stage 3B or C disease. Um, so they gave that upfront and then they took out a node and they looked under pathology whether they had a complete response, a partial response, or no response. For the patients who had no response, they then went on to get some adjuvant. Um, they got a completion at that point and they got adjuvant therapy. 
So in the patients who had a complete response, which was very high, about 50%, and the near CRs were um, an additional 11%, um, uh, these patients went on to do really well. This was just showing that the radiographic response was not as accurate as the pathologic response. So the patients with a major pathologic response um, had excellent relapse-free survival and distance-free survival. And the patients with partial pathological response had much worse outcomes now compared from the 93% to the 64%. So these were the patients who could benefit from additional adjuvant systemic therapy. And adding that systemic therapy did improve the non-responders just a little bit. So again, this curve rises up a little bit more. So the pros and cons of neoadjuvant immunotherapy, um, I'll start with the cons, because I think the pros are pretty obvious, but the cons were potential delay in, in standard of care. So maybe the tumor would grow quickly and then would become unresectable. Um, but mo for the most part, um, it, it seemed to be a positive. Uh, and, and one of the things was um, after they did this study, they went ahead and looked at the number of clones that was formed um, in the neoadjuvant versus the adjuvant setting. Um, and so you see that there was many, many more clones generated as a result of neoadjuvant. So this idea that if you take the tumor out first and then you put immunotherapy, you're activating a low amount of different type of T cells versus when the tumor is still there, you're gonna activate many more diverse T cells and you actually um, have a much more diverse T cell response. So it's sort of funny because it kind of completely makes sense and a lot of people have talked about it, but until we had the data, no one, no one was willing to do it. And then the, the only, the other new molecule I wanted to talk about was LAG3. So LAG3 is also seen on T cell effector surfaces and it gets upregulated um, during active T cell activation. Um, it's seen act, act, turned on in 75% of melanoma. Um, and so it is, it's, mechanism not completely understood, but it also is involved in activating um, CD4 positive cells. So, uh, I'm sorry, when it's turned on, it sort of dampens all these effects. So when you block it, you see CD4 cell activation and T cells get reactivated as well. But the, the reason I'm bringing this up is that this combination, again, the search for less side effects, but still that immune response, um, this combination falls under that. So relatinib, which is a LAG3 inhibitor, and nivolumab in the stage four setting has a slightly improved response rate over nivolumab alone, so 43% to 32%, um, but it has a better, and it has a slightly better, oh, sorry, and it only has a slightly worse um, adverse event rate. In the adjuvant setting, they did almost the same identical study where they gave the drug upfront before any surgery, took out the tumor and looked to see who were responders and non-responders. Um, these patients also did extremely well uh, for the individuals who were responders and a significantly less um, adverse event rate. So the jury is still out because there's no head-to-head -head comparison between this neoadjuvant with single agent nivolumab, um, but, but but this is an area that will continue to be pursued. Okay, so immunogenicity. How am I doing on time? I don't have a time clock on here. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so PD-1 sounds so good. Um, it, you can achieve a very high response rate, but the problem is many will also acquire resistance eventually, so about 30%. And we certainly see the, the people who don't respond. So a lot of work has been done on, well, what's acquired resistance and how do you predict if someone's gonna be a PD-1 responder? And so some of the things that come out is PDL one expression on the tumor, but I, that has been very variable and sort of fallen out of favor. CD8 positive T cell infiltration into the tumor itself. So the presence of CD8 positive cells in the tumor and then a high on antigen load. So the CD8 positive T cell story, um, this came out of UCLA and you can see here, they looked at a responder. So his tumor shrank um, to pembrolizumab versus a non-responder, someone didn't respond. And they showed that the CD8 positive T cells was way more um, dense, not only in the tumor itself, this is the line of the tumor with the stroma, but even in the surrounding stroma. 
um, whereas completely absent in the non-responding patient. And if you look at these graphs of individual patients, the same thing was true. The non-responders really <clears throat> didn't have much T-cell infiltration. So dermatologists have always been interested in T-cell infiltration, right? Like we always talk about tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And that was actually part of Dr. Mim's study as well. Um, but it's been really confusing TILs. Um, we rate them absent, present, but non-brisk, present, but brisk. Um, and it, the correlation with prognosis has been um, up and down. <laughs> like you, you can find studies that go in every direction. So I, I quote one study, a more recent study that pro prognosticated that if you had TILs that you were more likely to have a sentinel lymph node positivity. Um, and this ended up being true this association was true for men, but not with women, and was also associated with how thick the tumor is. And this was one of our studies where we were interested in why nodular melanomas end up being lethal, but often not superficial spreading melanomas. Um, and so we looked at the TILs of absent, present, non-brisk, present, brisk in um, nodular versus superficial spreading melanomas. Um, and we looked at when the tumors were still thin, less than two millimeters, and we looked at them when they were thick. And we saw that, um, here's the p-value, that in nodular melanomas, you usually, you way more often had no tumor infiltrate at all compared to superficial spreading melanoma, suggesting that maybe these tumors, for whatever reason, are not easily recognized by the immune system, A, because they grow too fast, B, because they downregulate some, you know, they immune evade somehow. This association was lost once the tumor was thick. So once they were deep, the, the, the infiltrate really made no difference at all. Um, and we also saw that this was only um, true in the, male, in the male group versus the female group, which is sort of another odd thing. So it, it is well known that men, especially men over 65, do worse with melanoma than um, age-matched women. And there's always been a thought that hormones are somewhat protective for women, but we don't have an answer completely to that yet as, as well, but just something to keep in mind. So in terms of the neoantigen story, which is we know that melanoma is one of the highest um, mutation. In fact, in the cancer atlas genome, melanoma is number one for number of mutations generated. It beats out lung cancer. And most of these are UV mediated when we're talking about cutaneous melanoma. So the neoantigen is a little different. Neoantigen is what the, can, it is, are these mutations and then how it's processed and presented to the immune system. And so this turns out to be really important for response to CTLA-4. So this is a cartoon showing that if a neopeptide is presented to your APC, then you're gonna have a very effective um, T cell, tumor specific T cell response. If it's a non-mutant peptide, um, there's no activation of tumor specific T cell and you just don't have a response. And some of the early studies looking at um, responders to CTLA-4, so these were individuals who shrank their tumors, um, they looked and saw that the individual re responded had a very high amount of neo peptides compared to the non-responders, okay? So these are the non-responders. Um, and when they went back and sequenced those little peptides, it ends up those sequenced with all sorts of infectious agents, viruses, bacteria, fungus. Um, and so what I took away from that, and I, I don't know if it's a, it's a fair um, um, takeaway, is that if you have been exposed to a lot of viruses and bacteria, you contain some of that language um, readily available to form um, an immune response to, and that's part of the reason why you had a, a better response. I, I, I brought this story up specifically for Dr. Gallo too, because it's so interesting. Um, so CTLA-4 response also in both mouse and human model does uh, um, relate to your gut microbiome. So these three bacteria in red were associated with a positive CTLA-4 response. So these were mice who were lavaged with either saline or these different types of bacteria. And when they were lavaged with these bacteria, you can see that the tumor size shrank. Um, and there have even been fecal transplant studies to show that you can transfer a response to CTLA-4 if you transfer um, fecal matter, which contains the bacteria. Um, and the theory behind this is that the presence of some of these good bacteria um, 
co-stimulates or helps stimulate the dendritic cells. Um, and this also leads to a much more efficient T cell activation. So the, definitely a huge part of the story are the dendritic cells, which I'm not gonna spend, you know, I don't have time to talk about today. So neal antigens though, previously it, we took too long to sequence. We only could guess at what they are, but now you can predict them. So you can take the patient's tumor, you can sequence them, sequence them. Um, then you can predict which ones will actually can bind to HLA and be present as a new antigen. And then you can synthesize them. So this is the concept of personalized vaccination. Um, so this has been done for many tumors at this point. Um, and so once you generate the new neoantigen peptides, you inject them back into the patient with a very good, you know, lots of adjuvant to stimulate a good immune vaccination response. Um, and the one that's been trialed, uh, one of my colleagues in Boston was trialing was Neovax. So this was mixed with poly ICLC for a really good response. So it's highly immunogenic. It's pretty safe with very few side effects. And what they're looking now is using this in combination with immunotherapy. So this was one of their early trials in both melanoma, non-small cell lung cancer, and bladder. And these are waterfall plots showing the change in volume of tumor size. So here you can see the majority of them are decreasing in size for all three cancers, but the most in melanoma. And these again are the spider plots. Again, some of these responders stay um, sort of locked in their size, but are not progressing. Um, I will say the major drawback with these personalized vaccinations is it takes a long time. So there's minimum several weeks period from when we get your when you get your metastatic melanoma to processing and then generating new peptides. Um, so and then ongoing are, are the mRNA vaccines coming out of COVID. Um, now you generate them for your melanoma and you combine it with PD1 inhibition. So these are ongoing studies, but the the, it, the report is that they're, they are doing well. Okay, and then the last thing is the problem of chance of metastases and the fact that when I told you that a predictor of immune response is CD8 or, or a response to immunotherapy is, is having a lot of CD8 positive T cells, well, we're really good at getting T cells to come into places, right? Like we do all sorts of things to get T cells to attract into a, a localized area. So this is an example of entrancement metastases, tumor on um, jumping through skin. And I think this one is a BCG injection actually. Okay, so for many years, people try different things, topical therapies, interlesional, radiation or destructive, topical treatments, imiquimod, I will talk about more, diphencyprone, squaric acid, gentian violet, azelaic acid, um, many things have been tried. So a I'm going to spend a little bit more time on that you're all familiar with. It's a TLR7-8 um, agonist. It's part of the innate immune system. But really probably what it's doing is generating type 1 interferon, um, which is a signal, again, like if you have a high type 1 interferon response, that's another signal that you're going to respond to these um, immunotherapies. So a um may work in more than one method though. So it may not just be uh, activating the um, innate immune system. Uh, in RAG2 knockout mice, which have no T cells, Mikmod still has an anti-tumor effect. Um, plasmoid cytoid dendritic cells are necessary for its anti-tumor effects. So this concept of improved antigen presentation. Um, and then in studies with squamous cell, it shifts the Treg population. So it decreases Treg and increases T effector cells. Um, and it probably also improves cir circulation so that T cells can actually home into the tumor itself. So, you know, we use it for lots of different tumors. This is an example of melanoma in situ, completely treated with topical amiquimod. Um, and length of treatment is variable, but for sure, if you generate inflammation, then you're likely to get a response. So in some ways, the length of time is not as important as seeing inflammation. And in an ideal world, we would have an even better um, biomarker. So the only really good controlled study is the LIMIT-1 study, which was out of England. It's a single arm study. 
and they were very stringent. They applied a specific regimen. Everyone got excised at the end of 12 weeks. And it was a really dismal complete regression rate, only 37%. So you would think that that would convince me to give up on imiquimod, but I rarely use imiquimod as a single agent. I usually use it in combination with other things. So, and there have been many studies, um, I, I, especially the use of retinoids, I think are very helpful with boosting the response. And I also use a lot of cryotherapy. Um, so this was an example of a 40 something year old woman she had already two Mohs procedures for melanoma in situ and it just kept going back. She wanted to know she had other options. She used um, imiquimod for 12 weeks with no erythema. This erythema is from two punch biopsies that we performed just to see if there was really nothing going on. Um, under pathology, she did have some immune infiltrate. After a little bit of cryo and topical imiquimod, she had a rip roaring response and eventually cleared all her pigmentation, probably even a little bit of vitiligo. Um, the challenge with these lesions, and that's another topic, is that she has had subsequent other recurrences on the periphery that we had then alternated either doing surgery or, or topical, depending on the situation. Um, um, so that's sort of another story about the field defect in these patients. Okay, here was another patient with um, scalp in transit metastases, a CKIT mutation. He was progressing on trial therapy and was at that time, ipilimumab was the only drug available and just started on ipilimumab. And the oncologist asked us for palliation help because by the time I saw him, he was um, exploding in tumor. So we applied, um, did cryotherapy and applied a micmod only in that one corner. Um, and two weeks later, he had like melting of his tumor, which is not from the Mikomod alone, because I told you when a Mikomod works, you have to see inflammation. We didn't see inflammation, we just saw shrinkage of tumor. So it clearly had to do with the fact that ipilimumab was already on board. Um, nonetheless, this we almost experienced what they call an upscopal effect, which is um, you can see regression of tumor in distant sites uh, apart from what you treated. And classic example is, um, you know, radiation and um, for some of the breast cancers um, causing an upscopal effect. So this was very interesting to us. Um, and again, here on pathology, you can see that this huge amount of tumor um, completely disappeared and the, and, the, and the tumor was all in these melanophages. So we did a series of uh, several patients in this way. Here's another example of, of a man um, who had in transit metastases on the forehead. So they were subcutaneous. Um, he also did top topical micmod cryotherapy um, for three months. And then, but unfortunately later on was to found, found to have a, a positive node in one of his lymph nodes and was started on PD-1 inhibition. And so during a micmod, again, you can see all that erythema. He had one right above um, this eyebrow. And the really cool thing was after PD-1 therapy was initiated, he developed the vitiligo poliosis and only one eyebrow turned white. Um, so it really uh, highlighted the fact that the micoma did uh, affect some degree the homing or the recognition or that the dendritic cells were um, instructed enough that it, 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 the effect occurred right there. Um, and sure enough, his um, uh, PD-1 shrank too. So, this is descriptive. A lot more work would have to be done to understand the true mechanism of what's happening here. Intralesional, again, people have tried all sorts of things for met, uh, in, in, in transit metastases, BCG, Rose Bengal, Fifluorouracil, IL-2, um, and the only approved one is TVEC. So what is TVEC? TVEC is HSV virus that has been doctored um, to also express GMCSF. So here's the GM GMCSF promoter inserted. Um, and it causes tumor lysis by being injected directly into the tumor itself. Um, and presumably the GMCSF also promotes a more robust um, anti-tumor response. As a single agent, the, the durable response of um, imlegic is actually not phenomenal, 16%. But even during, in these original studies, they did notice some distal effect as well in, in, in a few cases, not universally. Um, okay. 
So, but the main advantage of TVEC, in my opinion, is that there's really no systemic effects. So you don't worry about um, autoimmune toxicity. Um, they get a little bit of fever. Um, they come in every two weeks to get injected. But there's a lot of movement now to combining these oncolytic viruses with immunotherapy. So here's an example of TVEC with ipimumab, and they had um, the combination has a 39% response rate compared to 18% response rate. And here's an example of one of our patients who failed PD-1, continued to progress, and we treated them with TVEC um, with a complete response. So, yeah. Um, and so this has not been done just with um, uh, TVEC, uh, what am I saying? Oh, this combination has been tried with contact sensitizers as well. Um, and so here's an example out of uh, New York where they did um, diphencyprone, a contact sensitizer. So when they applied just the diphencyprone, not much was happening. Then they did pembrolizumab alone, not much happening. <laughs> then they applied uh, diphencyprone just to this area while they were getting pembrolizumab and they finally had a response. So a lot of work is being done with this idea of improving priming and adding these checkpoint blockade, releasing the immune system simultaneously, whether that um, improves response rate. So in conclusion, combination therapies are going to continue to emerge and we really have to think about how you tailor them specifically to the patient. Immunologic priming appears to be better in the neoadjuvant setting rather than the adjuvant setting and can we slowly shift this down to our deep, you know, stage two tumors? Um, I, I think that's where we are going. Melanoma vaccines already exist and in combination with anti-PD-1 therapy are already outperforming historic control. And the neoadjuvant immunotherapy will be tested on earlier and earlier tumors if we can justify the side effect profile, right? Um, and then finally, dermatology plays a crucial role in the management of these patients. Um, and, and likely an important role for this idea of immunologic priming. Thank you.